Well, praise God. How's everybody doing this morning? Y'all good? Ready for a good word this morning? Praise God. Well, get your Bibles out. And just kind of throw it open for right now. I got a few things I want to say before we get going here this morning. Um, one is um, the... Uh, huh. I had two. Now I forgot what one was. Okay, let me back up. Let me start over. Rewind that tape. Um, well, let me tell you about yesterday. Then I maybe I can remember what the other one was. I was going to say. Uh, I know some of y'all were praying for me. I told you I went into the uh, prison system uh, yesterday to, uh, d- of all things, to deliver the commencement address to the graduating uh, prisoners that have been going through getting their high school diploma. And uh, I-, I didn't think much about this, to be honest with you. I just I have a hard time saying no a lot of times. And, and a friend of mine who we I went to school with is the... Uh, high school teacher there, and so she asked me if I'd come and do it, and I said, oh, yeah, okay, no problem, you know. And, um, didn't really think the thing through, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, I've been in the jails before. We used to preach, you know, for years and years in the county jails. I just didn't really think the whole thing quite through. I was thinking that I'd just drive up there and get out and waltz in and do my deal and leave, you know. I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking, and uh, I didn't realize I was going to be shook down like everybody else going through the thing, you know. And So I was already irritated by the time they made me pull my boots off. There's nothing worse than having to take your boots off. I don't know why. I hate to take my boots off and put them back on. The sock never fits right after that, you know. And so I was a little irritated. And, and I wasn't quite familiar with the whole system. And then uh, the next thing I know, I'm inside the yard with just me and these two ladies. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. The guards are on the outside of the fence, and I'm on the inside of the fence. I don't, I was getting a little nervous. It's like, this, is, this doesn't seem quite right. I mean, you know. And so here we go through the yards, you know, and to another building. So, uh, you know, I'll just say, that little bit of heightened uh, insecurity there, you know. And uh, so we get in there, and then I'm inside then this, this gymnasium, and... Uh, I just didn't know what to expect, and so I'm in there with about 70 of the prisoners and just a few administration and myself, and so uh, they've got it all set up, and there's a podium and all this, and I'm supposed to speak at a certain time, and but they don't give me but 10 to 15 minutes, and I'm like, you know, I can't hardly clear my throat in 10 minutes. I mean, you know, this is ridiculous, but I'll do my best, you know, and they were really on me about it. I had to do time, so they said that... The, the, the choir is going to do music and some music. And I said, oh, okay. And I want you all to know, right then, the choir stepped up and the first thing they did was open at the national anthem. And the man that, that sang the national anthem, by the time he finished, I had tears in my eyes. I have never in my life heard anybody sing the national anthem like this. And I mean, it was unbelievable. The next song that the, the choir sings is, is welcome Holy Spirit. I'm like, what? You know, and then the next song they sing uh, was uh, another Christian song. And before long, we're having Holy Ghost Church in this place. And I'm like, man, now we're talking. This is, I'm okay with this. And so, you know, uh, they'd opened in prayer and then done the national anthem. And then we're singing the Holy Spirit song. We're singing, man, I'm saying, man, this is all right. I mean, music, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then one of the largest men I've ever seen in my entire life <clears throat> steps up and comes over because it was the end of the superintendents. He was retiring, and he comes over there and he sings, Thank You for Giving to the Lord. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that song. Man, I'm sitting there with tears in my eyes this guy singing this song. This guy is a beast, and he is so full of Jesus, it's unbelievable. And so anyway, we had Holy Ghost service by the time I got up there. I didn't figure there's hardly even anything for me to do, you know. But uh, I got up, and, and so I preached, you know, for my 15 minutes. And, uh, man, it was great, and, and it was a great time, and, and everybody responded great. Got to talk to a lot of the guys afterwards. And uh, So anyway, 
Thank you for praying. It was a great victory, and it was a really great eye-opening experience for me to see how many brothers inside that prison love Jesus. It was amazing. It was amazing. So, that was a glorious thing. I still can't remember the first thing I was going to tell you. I know it was good. Maybe I'll think of it later. So anyway, let me just tear into the message here this morning. And uh, I, I need to read a little bit right here from you. And so I know sometimes, it's, oh, I know what it was. Thank you, Jesus. I want to stop and I want to pray for our, our kids blaze going on over here. Because, you know, we get to doing things around here. And y'all that have been in, involved with the Living Waters Church for forever or a long time, you know, that, you know, we're about the Word of God here. We're about teaching people the Word of God and preaching the Word of God. And, and, and we're not here about playing fun and games. And the kids are over there. And there's, there's games involved, but every game has to lead to a point about Jesus or the Word or, 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 or putting things within the kids. And I'm really shocked as I talk to parents that have left this church and moved to other towns and whatever, and how hard it is for them to find a church that has anything to do with children really teaching them the Word of God. A lot of the churches, they have games, and they have fun, and they have drinks, and they have cookies, and they have this, but they don't teach them anything. And I thought to myself, man, how do we take that for granted about the great thing going on today? So let's just stop and pray for them, okay? Father, right now, we just stretch out our faith over there towards all the kids over in Kids Ablaze and the teachers. We just thank you for blessing them and strengthening them. And Lord, that, that, that here at Living Waters Church, we have an educational program to teach children the Word of God to teach our youth the Word of God, and, Lord, to teach our adults the Word of God. And so we thank you for that. Just bless them today. Let their minds be open. Let seeds be planted in their hearts that will, in the days ahead, come to great fruit in their lives. And we give you praise for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now I need to read something to you, okay, so we can get started here this morning. I need to read a speech to you. All right, it's not my speech. I didn't write it, but I, was, I told you we've been, we've been fasting and praying for, for America for the United States, for these up, coming up to elections and keeping our mind, and I ask you to keep your mind focused on it and pray for it and, you know, in some way or another do that. And so part of what I'm doing is, is I'm, I'm going back and reading stuff and, and looking at documents and using that as a prayer focus for, for the nation. And I, and I was reading Patrick Henry's speech. It was done on March the 23rd, 1775. It was given to the Continental Congress. This is before the American Revolution. Uh, the, the, the Continental Congress had been meeting for almost a month and people had been giving up, standing up and giving speeches and there was a lot of fluff and a lot of puff and a lot of different, the, the, the colonies kind of arguing amongst each other, you know, to figure out how they were going to do whatever they were going to do and there wasn't a lot of unity uh, in the Continental Congress at that time. Although they had gathered and knew that what England was, was doing was wrong, they just didn't have it together until this speech. And so I was reading it, and I want to read it to you. So can you bear with me for just a little bit because it's, it's reading, and, and just don't go to sleep on me, okay? When I look up here in a minute, if you're asleep, I'm going to shout really loud. Okay, here we go. It says, No man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as the abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed this house. But different men often see the same subject in different light. And therefore, I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if entertaining as I do the opinions of a character very opposite to theirs. I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The questions before the house is one awful moment of, to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at the truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinion at such a time through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself guilty of treason towards my country and an act of disloyalty towards the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, he's speaking to the President of the Continental Congress. Mr. President, it is, a nat it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. 
We are apt to shut our eyes against the painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beast. Is this the part of wise men engaged in great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be the numbers of those who having eyes see not, having ears hear not, and things which are so nearly concerning their temporal salvation. For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst and to provide for it. But I have one lamp by which my feet are guided. That is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging the future, but by the past and judging the past I wish to know that there have been in the conduct of the British ministries for these past 10 years to justify those hopes which, with which gentlemen we have pleased to solace themselves and to the house. Is that insidious smile in which our petitions have been lately received? Trust it not. Sir, I prove to, it will prove to snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports those who, uh, with, with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to the work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love. Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are implements of war and subjugation. The last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sirs, what means this martial array if its purpose is to be quartered of the world? Oh, excuse me. I ask, gentlemen and sirs, what means this martial way, if purpose be, to the force of our submission? Can gentlemen assign any of the possible motives for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call all, the, uh, to call all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and to rivet us upon those chains in which the British ministries have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sirs, we've been trying argument for the past ten years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. Have we held the subject up in every light which is capable, but it has been... All in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find and what, uh, what, uh, from what already exists? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves. Sir, we have done everything that we could have done to avoid the storm which is now coming. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and the parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have been produced additional violence and insults. Our supplications by disregard and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne in vain after these things we have indeed found hope and peace and reconciliation. There's no longer any room, for if we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve those inestimable privileges for which have been so longly contended, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of the contest shall be obtained. We must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms, to the God of hosts, is all that is left us. They tell us, sirs, that we are weak, 
unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be strong? Will it be next week or the next year? Will it be when we're totally disarmed and when the British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by, uh, by inaction? Shall we acquire the means of an effectual resistance by lying supplantly on our backs and hugging the delusions of this phantom of hope until our enemies have so bound us hand and foot? Sirs, we are not weak if made a proper use of those means by which God of nature hath placed in our power. The millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty in such a country that which we possess are in invincible by any force in which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is one just God who presides over all the destinies of nation and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is not to the vigilant, to the active, to the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election if we are base enough to desire it. It is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our changed are for ords. The clanking has been heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. Let it come. I repeat, sirs, let it come. It is in vain, sirs, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. War is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. We stand here idle. What is that gentleman's wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to purchase at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it. Almighty God, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, Give me liberty or give me death. They said when he finished this speech that there was not a sound in the room. That everyone was totally and completely silent. That he stepped down from the podium and he walked back into the midst of the people and he sat down. And that everyone sat silent listening to those words that he had just said. At the end of that speech, everyone came into unity as a Continental Congress. They came into unity. They made their decisions and they moved forward. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing that one man's speech could move this whole group and get everything into unity. My prayer has been for the United States that we would have a man that would step up behind a podium that could deliver a speech like this that would unify our nation, that we would all come together. Because you see, I believe, and what the title of this message is today is Going Beyond Hope. What we've had a lot of times is sit around and we hope things are going to be better for tomorrow. But I want to show you this morning and tell you what the Word of God says, that you have to move beyond hope. And you have to move into the area of faith if you're going to see God move in your life. We all want to see God move. We all want to see miracles. We want to see things take place. We want to see great things done, but it doesn't come at an easy price. This great nation was formed by men laying down their lives, their livelihood, and knowing that they were going to sacrifice their everything in order to see a nation rise out of the midst of it that would be a great nation. It's a big thing. It's a, it's a, uh, that's what a hero truly is. Somebody that's willing to lay their life down, right? To see some, something, someone, some, uh, uh, position, some, whatever it may be, move forward and then it can be a better place for the rest. Hello? Y'all with me? In our lives, in this walk of faith that we have, in our faith and belief in our great commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ. Hello? There comes a time in our lives where we have to be the same way in our faith and in our walk and in our position in life. We've got to get out of hope and move into faith. We've got to come to a place in life where we no longer sit idly in our homes 
reading our Bibles, knowing what we believe, that we're not going to move out to see that we can make a better tomorrow for others. Are you all with me? I'll use Bruce over here as an example. Every Tuesday night, he comes up here, he puts on a pot of coffee, and he waits. He waits to see if there's anybody going to come and show up on the Tuesday night meetings that we have uh, to break addictions in people's lives. He does that because God delivered him. God set him free. He has a testimony and a power of faith on the inside of him that says, I know I have a word that could help somebody else. But he's willing to go faithfully every Tuesday night, put on a pot of coffee and wait. Sometimes one person shows up. Sometimes no person shows up. Sometimes 10 people show up. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He goes just by faith saying, Lord, here I am. But I want to tell you something. I told him the other night. I believe that room's going to be full pretty soon. Because I believe people are getting into a time and a place in life that they're going to have to get off their duff and get out there and do something. Because, you know, you can only live in misery so long until you're finally going to get sick of the misery. Hello? And when you get sick of the misery, it takes you to move out of hope into faith to see something happen. Christians for too long have been going to church on Sunday morning, singing the nice songs, going through the motions, going through everything, and leaving the doors and not affecting this world. I believe that I have an answer for people. Otherwise, you don't know, you don't know the things that go on in my my mind and that that I do. There's so many times I've wanted just to throw in the town and say, forget it, ain't nobody listening. That I have wanted just a chunk in the town and say, forget it. There's no sense. There's no sense in putting the radio out. There's no sense doing this video. There's no sense taking up Jake's time to, to edit. There's no sense in putting it out on the radio and paying the money. There's no sense in having really church on Sunday morning. Let's just tell everybody to go eat, drink, me, merry, and just prepare yourselves for when Jesus comes back. I'll be honest with you. That thought goes through my mind a lot. Y'all give us... Uh, uh, with pastor's appreciation last Sunday and we're so blessed and we get the cards and we see the words and we see the things coming and those are the things that continue to encourage us to keep putting one foot in front of the other going forward because it's an uphill battle. Yesterday when I was in the prison and I was looking at those men's faces and and I I gotta be honest with y'all, these guys are sitting on the edge of their chair when I was speaking and I was just, I I was just, man, I didn't know what to say. I don't even know what to, I, I listen, I can't even prepare for 10 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Because if I even go to the Bible and try to prepare for 10 minutes, I mean, it takes me 10 minutes to introduce myself. You you see what I'm saying? So it's how do you tie in what Jesus has done for me and what the Word of God says, and how do you tie this in and give it to these? But these guys are sitting on the edge of their chairs. I'm saying, I haven't seen hunger like that in a long time. They were hungry. They wanted to know the Word of God. They wanted to know that God had delivered this cowboy and set me free. When I began to tell them, yeah, listen, guys, those of you that have fought and struggled through school, I know what it's like because I have dyslexia and I I fought it all my life. Do you know that that preparing the message, I couldn't take anything in. I couldn't take my iPad in. I couldn't take my phone in. I couldn't take anything in. All I could walk in was with my driver's license. You know how hard it is to defend yourself with your driver's license? (laughs) And then at the last moment, they took it from me and gave me a little visitor's card. I'm like, wow, thanks. It doesn't do any good to throw it up and say, I'm Robert Richards. That's not much of a defense. But when, but when I, I, I get in there and you're, 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 you're sitting there and, and I start to see hunger in people's faces, I start to see what they're doing and I start to see what's taking place. And I was like, wow, look at the hunger in these guys. And it keeps me going to say, hey, there's people out there that do want to know what the Word of God says. There is, there is, strip down and, you know, and I, and, and, and I had, I had one piece of paper with me that I had begun to write down on, uh, the, a few scriptures. Cause I thought that I could, which I was mistaken, I always doubt myself. I thought that I could freeze up and need something to look at. And so I went to write it down, but as I tried to write it down, I, I couldn't write it. I couldn't get my B's and my D's going right. And I couldn't get it on, so I started starting to scrum. So I told these guys, listen, guys, I mean, 
I had trouble writing this down, but I want you to know I'm standing here before you today as Dr. Richards because the power of God on the inside of me, you can do anything. Because with God, nothing's impossible. You know how much people need a, a word of hope? You know how much people just need a word of hope that you've got in your mouth? Listen to folks, it's time for us to be like Patrick Henry was that day and to step out and say, look, we have an answer and his name is Jesus. We have to move beyond hope and just saying, oh, isn't this a sweet, nice gospel, whatever. We have to go forward and say, we've got an answer. You know how I know it's an answer? Because it's worked in my life. And if it worked for me, it'll work for you. People want to water everything down there. People want to uh, 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 make us as Christians feel like, well, we can't have a voice and we can't say anything. And I'm telling you, that's the wrong motive. That's the wrong answer. The answer is that we need to speak louder. We need to be like blind Bartimaeus on the road of life that when, when uh, everyone tells you to shut up, you cry out more. Hello? Because I'm telling you, I don't care what the Christianity that you have been through that didn't work for you. You may not have got the formula right, but God works. Christianity works. Jesus is alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he did then, he'll do now if you'll get in faith. If you'll move beyond hope and get in faith. Hello? Look at the person beside you and say, man, he's doing good this morning. So go to the go to the your Bible. Go to First John chapter three, and let's look at some things here. Let me help you today to go beyond the hope in your life and move into faith. Not just hope for a better tomorrow. Not just hope for a better job. Listen to me. In this bad economy, I'm telling you, God can promote you. We say, well, I don't know. Statistics are really bad. I, listen to me. I don't mess with the natural. I deal with the supernatural. I don't understand how it always works. But that doesn't make any difference to me because I'm telling you, God can make it work. If Isaac sowed seed in a famine and got the biggest harvest he ever has gotten, God can still do that today. He said, well, I don't know. It's just hard for me to believe. Exactly. You don't believe it, you don't get it. He said, well, that's just, you know, uh, that's just stretching me. Come on, be stretched. It's time to be stretched in life. It's time to get out of our comfort zone. Hello? 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Can I have an amen? amen. You hear it? See what they say? Behold, what manner of love is this that you're going to call us your children? Therefore, the world does not know, does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we shall know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in them purifies himself just as He is pure. He said that when, when you just realize that you're a child of God and realize that Jesus wants to work in you and transform you and bring you from glory to glory, that that, that hope, when you go step right beyond it, takes you into faith, and that faith begins to work in your life and change you and create something in you. Listen to me, the only, the only thing holding you back is you and what you believe. It's what you believe. Peter, when he got out of the boat with Jesus and walked on the water, he, that dude was walking on water. And he was coming, he was doing it. And rather than saying, whoo, man, look at me, I'm doing it, I'm walking on water, whoo, whoo, doing the little foot moves across the water and scooting across, wouldn't you? No, because I want to tell you where your faith is, you may be tippy. Oh, 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 oh. Testing the water out. Is it, is it hard here? Oh, 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 oh. I made it. Because you see, that's where your faith was. But if you were walking on the water and you were just in faith like Jesus did, you'd just be skipping and sliding and, man, I mean, doing the... Waltz across Texas over it. I don't know. Do you follow me? See, that's where you know what your faith would be, is how would you react to stepping and walking on water? Because you are doing the impossible, the natural impossible. And if you would say, gosh, I don't know how I'd feel. I guess I'd be having to test the step out. So if I was just going to go, Whoa. and if that's where you're, then that's where your faith is. 
baby step, faith to step out and do it. Hey, at least you're still walking. But what happened to old Peter? He got to looking around. He got to looking at the waves. He got to looking at the sea. He got to looking at everything around him. And when he got to looking around him, then what happened? He began to sink. He began to sink. Now, do you even not realize how supernatural that is? He began to sink in the water. Not... You follow me? So as his faith is waning, he's going... Bloo, bloo, bloo. Instead of saying, I'm sinking! Not, I fell in the water. Y'all see that? But that's what we do. We let the natural things of this world and what we're looking at and what we're seeing begin to dictate what are we having faith in. So instead of just getting out of the boat and looking back at all the rest of the disciples saying, man, it's hard, look at this, and jumping up and down on it and saying, whoo, look at this water. I mean, you might want to ask Jesus, is it all hard? Is it just wide? Is it right when my foot steps down? I mean, I kind of like to know the rules here, so I'm not just going to, you know, step off the edge of the hard water. Right? But if he did it and you're doing it, you're doing it. You follow what I'm saying? You've already stepped across the line of hope and into faith, and you're, you're doing it. You're walking on water. You saw that miracle. You saw God do something. You saw it happen. There's no use thinking because it's religious thinking that maybe something just happened to fall off the edge of the throne of heaven and you just happened to just land in your lap. That's what a lot of Christians think, like they got away with it. You know, God did a miracle in their life and they got away with it because if he'd have really known the real truth, he probably wouldn't have done it. Hello. Hope is the beginning where you've heard truth, but you desire more. Inactive faith that's down on the inside of you, it begins to stir down in the recesses of your heart. But you've got to launch to the next stage. It's called faith. Hope is what propels you forward towards faith and then the final victory. But you can't stay in hope. You can't just say, and I'm hoping and praying everything's going to be okay. No, you've got to move into faith. You've got to move into faith. Let's go look at another scripture here. John chapter 4. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it and read just a couple. John chapter 4, verse 10. talks about Jesus and the woman at the well. He's going down the road and he comes across this, this Samaritan woman. And she's got her bucket to draw water out of the well. And, and, and they enter into this conversation and, and they talk back and forth and she's, she's pretty sharp. And in verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Folks, I'm telling you, as Christians, our Christianity is not just for getting us to dying. Hear me. Our Christian faith is not just about getting us to the place that we enter into heaven when we die. Uh, Glory to God, that's great. But Jesus came and bought your victory for more than that. So that inside of you can be changed, inside of you can be be, become an overcomer and a conqueror, and inside of you can affect the people that are around you. That's why he's called you. That's why, that's why you, listen, we get so religious, and I just hate religion. I hate it. But we get so stinking religious, you know? We think that we did God a favor by asking him and to save us and coming into the kingdom of God. We do. We, we, we act like, God didn't know we were going to do it, give our hearts to him. We act like like it, it was a surprise. Him. Oh, oh, okay, you finally accepted Jesus. Well, great. I'm glad you did. Come on into the kingdom. When the whole time the Bible says that God's working in us from the day that before you were born, in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully creating you to, to, to come into this world so that He, you could... Become who you really are. 
by knowing Jesus, by asking him to come into your life, to forgive your sins so that you could reach your full potential in life of standing on planet Earth, being a child of God, and being able to tell somebody else about Jesus. That's your purpose, folks. Not being a preacher. Maybe, maybe not. But being a person that in your life and the way you live your life and the what you say and what you believe in affects somebody else. That they look at you and say, that just isn't right. I, I, I don't, I, I, even though I'm, as a pastor, I, I'm not out there just beating the tambourine, beating my big old Bible all the time with people. But I just try to live a life out there in the world and all the guys that I'm around just try to live a life that they know what I believe. Do I do everything right? No, I can get mad and throw a hammer just as quick as anybody can. But then I just go over there and pick it up and say, sorry guys, I shouldn't have done that. I should have been believing God and I didn't do it. And now it's got to where everybody looks at me and said, you need to be praying. <laughs> looks like it's going to rain. We've got to pour concrete. You need, you need to be praying. I'm like, oh yeah, I want me to pray, huh? See, something's got to be different on the inside of you, church. You got to move beyond in, in just hoping, and you got to be like Patrick Henry was to say, "Listen, it's time to give me liberty or give me death. Give me victory. Give me faith, or, 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 or I'm not moving forward. I want to see victory." You got to go out of hope and into faith. This woman, she said, she, "Jesus said, you don't understand the gift that's in front of you. You don't understand who it's talk, who you're talking to." She went on to say, the woman said, Sir, I have nothing to draw water with in the well's deep. And where then do you get this living water? He says, you don't have anything. Excuse me, you don't have anything to draw water with. And they go through this discussion. Are you like Jacob? And they, they're, they're talking back and forth. And Jesus said, whoever drinks this water, you're going to get thirsty. You're going to need, you're going to need some more water. And it goes on down, and the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst. See, he said something to her that caused her to say, You mean you got water that I would never be thirsty for, but... Jesus wasn't talking about drinking water. He was talking about something down on the inside of your soul that would change your life. That water, that source on the inside of you that would come down on the inside of you and and would be a, a well to you. That relationship of knowing him that would come into your life and man, it would change you. That you could drink from it every day. That you could go to Jesus in prayer and be satisfied. That no matter where you are, no matter what far dungeon they stuck you in. Hello? You could still pray and talk to heaven. You could still have a source in life. See, the world operates on how good is everything in their life. Like how much of the, the material needs, their soulish needs, their, you know, different things coming into the life in, to whether they're enjoying life or having fun. How much their flesh can be stimulated. Right? And I like to stimulate my flesh. I like ice cream. You know? I, 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 there are some things I like to enjoy. I like to sit around and just laugh and talk and have fun. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that's, that's all bad. I'm just saying, if that's your only source of joy, your mate's going to give you your source of joy, your spouse is giving you your source of joy, you're looking at all these kind of things like this and trying to find your, your source. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to come up with a dry hole. Hello? Nobody likes a dry hole. If you've ever drilled a well and it was dry, it ain't good. There's no joy in it. If your soul's like that, every time you need something, you try to tap into it, but, you know, you were waiting for so-and-so to make you happy or so-and-so to make you happy or this deal went through, then you were happy. I want to tell you something. You're going to be miserable all your life. That's what's wrong with the world today. The world's only happy if it gets stimulated. What can you give me to make me happy? The problem is, is when you... Have you all noticed that? That we humans only live... We, we live at, at whatever level we're at, but then we want to go to the next level. And then when we get to the next level, well, then we're still not satisfied with it. And then we want to go to the next level. So if you were making $100 a week, then you want two and then you want three and you want four and you never seem to be satisfied because that can't satisfy the what's inside your soul only jesus can do that so anyway the woman that jesus keep talking 
He tells her all this stuff. She believes in him. She runs and tells everybody in town. And just look down at verse uh, uh, 39. So she goes back and she tells everybody in town what Jesus said to her, what he's done for. And it says, And they went out of the city and they came to him, and many of the Samaritans that were in the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Now that's glorious, right? People are believing in what she said. But read on. He told me whatever I did. So the Samaritans had come to him. They urged him to stay with him. He stayed there two more days, and many more believed because of his own words. In other words, what the woman said started something, but then people began to be hungry themselves and sought Jesus, and then that moved them into the next realm of faith. Right? This is where we've got to be as Christians. This is where we've got to be in our life today. We can't just live in hope and say, oh, well, it'll all work out. No, it's time to move out of hope into faith. It's time to draw the line in the sand and say, no, 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 I am a Christian. I do believe in Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and Savior. I do believe the Bible is true from the front to the back. Last night, I, was, uh, I got in kind of late and I was just didn't want to go to bed. And right then, and I turned on the television, and I was slipping through the History Channel. And it said, uh, mermaids revealed. No, mermaids are found. It's like, give me a break. It's on the History Channel. Mermaids found. I'm a mermaid. I got to see this one. Flipped it on there. And, and uh, you know, it took me literally about 35 seconds of viewing it to just flip it off because the first thing I come up against is it was talking about, yes, as, as humans have evolved as we came out of the sea, you know, 50 million years ago, and that, you know, uh, and I was like, what? What? I said, you know, I started praying right then. I said, Lord, somebody's going to watch this that don't know, you know, come here from Sikkim, and they're going to think that's true. I didn't crawl out of the sea. I was created by God. He said, well, you know, there he is. Get off of it. Well, you know, son, no, get off of it. It's stupid. It don't add up. It ain't right. Either my Bible is true, and it started in the garden, not of the monkey, not as a one-cell plankton crawling out of the earth. Either it started in the garden, or, or, or you, you don't have anything to base your Christianity upon. I said it. Now, see, I don't care that somebody doesn't believe the Bible's true. See, I'm not like... I'm not like uh, the Muslim race, the Muslim religion, the radical Muslims. They'll kill you if you don't believe what they think is true. I don't really care. If you want to go to hell, go to hell. I love you and I want to pray for you and I want to tell you the gospel. But if you don't want to believe the gospel and you don't want to believe in Jesus, that's the choice you made as a free will being. And then if that's where you end up, then I'm, I'm sorry. But I believe my Bible's true. And I'm going to tell you it's true. But I'm going to tell you in a loving fashion. I'm not going to kill you if you don't believe it. Are you all with me? There's a big difference there, folks. And the world needs to wake up to that. As a Christian nation, we're, we're sympathetic towards the, 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 the views of other people. And they have the right to worship that away if they want to worship that away. But don't try to kill me because I'm worshiping the way I am. There's a big difference. Hello? But I believe I'm right. I believe it with all of my heart. I'm not fooled and deceived or brainwashed. I just know from experience, Jesus is the answer. And the Bible is true. Hello? Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Curses the man who trusts in the man, who makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. He should be like a shrub in the desert, shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. In the salt land, which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by waters, which spread out its roots by the river. Will not fear when the heat comes. Its leaf will, will, will be green and will not be anxious for the year of drought, nor will he cease from yielding fruit. So what I want to be. Amen? I want to be planted by the river. I don't want to be in the salt flat. I don't know about y'all, but I am so glad it's gotten cool. I am so tired of heat. 
I don't know if I'm just getting older and turning into more of a sissy or what the thing is, but I just did not enjoy sweating anymore. And I sweated this summer about all I want to sweat. I'm tired of it, and I'm glad we got some cool. Hello? It ain't no fun being in the heat, the way I look at it. I don't like the extreme cold either. I like today. I wish we could just freeze it and have it like this always. <laughs> I would like to live in a land that was just like this morning here with rain periodically. I believe that'd be heaven, wouldn't it? (laughs) That's what we'd call that place, heaven. But folks, I want to tell you something. We got to move this, our lives that we've just been in hope and passive into faith that's active. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. You know, just hang on with me a few more minutes and we'll wrap this up. It says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Everybody say a new way. New ways are good. By a new and living way, which he shall consecrate for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's the way you have to draw near to Jesus. A true heart full of assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Listen to me. Folks, there is, there is mountains that can be moved by your faith being in full assurance. You hear what I'm saying? Mountains can be moved in your life by you being in full assurance of faith. Religion has taught us for too long to be passive. And I'm trying to push you, trying to kick you out of the boat so you can see the water's hard and you can walk on it. I'm trying to to just give you the old boot this morning. Kick you right over the other side and let you stand up on your own two feet and see that you can walk on water and be fully assured of your faith. Listen to me, Jesus can change your life. Yesterday when I was in that service in, in the uh, prison unit, a man stood up, probably, probably the largest man I've ever seen in my life. This guy was huge. He stands up and he walks to the podium and, and says, uh, I, I have something that I'd like to say. And so he gets up and he commences to give his own testimony about how he had lived a life of, of in gangs and violence and full of pride and came into the unit and he was full of pride and he, he, he argued with everybody and was just in trouble continually. And so he said, until that day in 2009 when Jesus Christ came into my heart, he said, I turned my life over to Jesus and I'm a changed man. Everybody in here, I believe you can say I'm a changed man. And everybody started hollering and hooping and clapping because they knew the guy. They could see the evidence that he was no longer the same man. Folks, that's, to me, nothing but proof in my heart to take me into faith and full assurance that Jesus can change anybody. He can work in any situation out. He can work in any person if we will simply believe him. And here's this man as tender when he turned around and looked. Like, if you saw him from a distance, you're like, holy cow, I hope that guy don't say nothing to me. He's huge. One of the biggest men I've ever seen in my life. And when you got up and you looked in his face, you could just see the sweet love of Jesus in his eyes. And I'm like, yeah, see, Jesus can take the biggest one. He can take the Goliaths of this world, turn them into babies. This guy wept and cried and he said, thankful for what Jesus has done in his life. Looked at all those men and said, you guys need to serve Jesus. I mean, who's going to say, I don't think so. (laughs) We've got to get active in our faith. We've got to get to the point of the faith where we, folks, you know that you're right. It's not up for question. I'm not talking about arguing with other Christians about the way they believe, man. Just leave them alone. Leave them alone. I am, my principle is, is if anybody from any other denomination, any other says that they believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, that's it for me. I don't care. I want to talk about anything else. 
I'm not going to argue with them about church or dress or ritual or this or that. Or the other. I don't even care. Don't even want to deal with it. Don't even want to go in there and say, okay, God bless you, and go on. I don't even want to mess with it. I ain't going to mess with them. If they come up there and try to argue with me that my faith in, in Jesus is not right, you know, they don't, they're non-believers, and they want to argue, but then, then the fight's on. Right? You're, 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 you're picking on the wrong guy. But I'm not going to sit around and argue with other Christians about what's the right way to serve communion or what's the right way to do this or have a church service. That's ridiculous. Just forget it. This is what we're comfortable with. This is the way we believe. This is what we're doing. You know, we get to heaven, get sorted out. Jesus wants to spank me when I get to heaven. I'll let him do it. Right? If he gets up there and he says, Robert, you're an ignorant redneck. What in the world are you doing? I say, well, I'm sorry, Lord. It felt right. You with me? I'll, but I'll let him deal with me. I ain't worried about anybody else. I'll let him judge me. I ain't going to worry about anybody else. Don't worry about anybody else. Get your faith assured in what you want to believe. You know? You feel like you got to kneel down and pray? Then kneel down and pray. You don't have to get some sort of consensus about it. You want to throw beans on the floor and kneel down on beans so it hurts more and pray? Well, then just knock yourself out. Don't make me a bit of difference. As long as you're praying. Are y'all with me here? But then don't come over there and try to get me to kneel down on beans. I have hard enough getting on my knees anyway nowadays. Well, that's not true. I don't have a problem getting on my knees. I just have a problem getting back up. Are y'all with me here? Get fully assured in your faith. Move out of those areas of hope. Don't let there be gray areas in life. Well, I'm not really sure if I believe this or believe that. Get fully assured so that you're ready to stand up and give an argument for what you believe. Maybe you're like the blind man. You just say, listen, I don't know, but once I was blind and now I see, that's it. I mean, he put the whole uh, religious crowd of the day, all the Sanhedrin at, 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 at silence when he said, I don't know. That's okay to say that. He said, I don't know, but I was blind, and now I see. Deal with it. They said, well, he couldn't have done that because he's a sinner. He's talking about Jesus. He said, I don't know. I didn't know I was blind, and now I see. I know I was unhappy, and now I'm happy. I know I was lost, but now I'm found. I just don't really care what you think. This is what's happening to me. I am fully assured in my faith. That kind of a position for church launches you out of hope into faith and then puts you in a place where then all of a sudden now you're ready to play ball with life. So if that life throws you a curveball, you know, you can hit it. Throws you a knuckleball, you might miss the first one. Eh, you'll get it down. You'll get the second one. Y'all with me? Because it life doesn't play fair. But when you're fully assured in your faith, you're set on that ground. You're not on shaky ground. You're on a firm rock. You're just sitting there with your bat saying, okay, I might have missed that one, but just, just throw me another one. I'm going to knock it out of the park because power of God's on the inside of me, and I'm going to hit this sucker. I'm going to hit me a home run. Are y'all with me? The devil doesn't know what to do with you when you're in that position. Because all of a sudden he's backing up like saying, what? If he thinks he's got you defeated, he thinks he's got you questioning his faith, your faith. He thinks he's got you on, you know, like you might give up. Oh, man, you're going to have one bad fight. But when you're standing there saying, you want a piece of me? I'm going to knock your head off. Fight may not last long, but I'm going to hit you as hard as I can in the head with this bat. The enemy has to say, you know, I think he's crazy enough to try to do it. Makes a big difference. Makes a really big difference. It's a horrible story, but it's a really good example. When I was a young man, before I knew Jesus, I, I got in a little altercation with a guy one night. He was a big boy. And it was one of these situations where I didn't have any place to back up to and and. It, just seemed like I had to move forward. And so he commenced to tell me what he was going to do, thrash me severely. And so I just listened to him, and I, had to, I knew I had to call a bluff. 
Because he probably would have thrashed me severely. And I just looked at him and I said, before this night's over, I'll cut your ear off. And it didn't seem to phase him until I told him, and, and I'm going to eat it right in front of you. <laughs> Never forget the look on that guy's face. <laughs> he looked at me, and he said, man, you're crazy. And I said, yeah, I am. And he said, I ain't going to mess with you. And he left. You know, my knees went weak. I drug myself over to the pickup and got in and left as fast as I could. <laughs> but the point was, is I had to call a bluff and I, and, it, and I had to just man up. I want to tell you something. When you're fully assured in your faith, that's what you do to the enemy. The enemy steps up and you look at him and you say, oh, man, you're going to want to go to hell after I get through with you. <laughs> You're going to want to crawl back in your cave. You're going to want to get in the fire because I am going to hurt you. Amen? Let me give you one last scripture. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, and I'm finishing here. It says, for whatever... You know, I've been called a lot of things in life. You know, some good, some bad. I mean, called a lot of things in life, but I love this scripture because 1 John 5, 4 says, for whatever. Whatever you may be, whatever you may think of yourself, whatever is born of God. I can fit in that category of whatever. People may not know how to categorize me, but I, I, I can fit in there of whatever. Be, you know, redneck. Cowboy, idiot, fool. I can fit into whatever. So I'm in the category. I've loved this scripture. When I first read, read it the very first time, I was like, <laughs> I like that one. I want to memorize that one because I'm in there. Whatever. For whatever is born of God, what does it say? Overcomes the world. You see, church, if you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, and you are born again, and, and he lives on the inside of you, you are a world overcomer, whether you know it or not. What is it saying? This is the victory that overcomes the world. What is it? You're a world overcomer, and it's activated by your faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen to me. It doesn't say he who believes and is a Baptist. He who believes and is a Methodist. He who believes and is a Catholic. He who believes and is a Mormon. He who believes. It doesn't say that. It says he that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So every person that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, ask him into their life. That person is a world overcomer by their faith. If they're not overcoming in the world, it's because their faith isn't active. They're still in hope. Hello? You're with me. Amen. Well, put your Bibles up. And if you would, just stand to your feet for me, please. Can I have my prayer team come down, my pastoral team this morning? Church, listen to me. All of y'all out there watching and listening by radio and video today. Let me just ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Have you asked Him into your life? Think about that for a minute. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and have you asked Him to come into your life? If you have, you are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror because Jesus is with you. If you haven't, you've never really thought about it. You really are not sure. Well, then listen, it's real simple. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that Jesus is the Son of God. That He'll forgive your sins and come into your life. It's not rocket science. 
It's not complicated. It's not joining a church. It's not religion. It's your faith and your belief becoming active and saying, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So everyone in here, just for a moment, just bow your heads. Give all your neighbors around you a little bit of privacy because I just want to ask you, do you know in here, everybody in this audience, do you know for sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven because Jesus is the Lord of your life? If you're not sure, well, then I want to pray with you. So if you're not sure and you want me to pray with you, just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I I want to pray today. I want to ask Jesus to come into my life. I want to be sure of my salvation. If that's you, just lift up your hand and say, yeah, I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with me, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, listen, I want everyone to pray with me. Those of you watching, those of you listening by video, or watching by video and listening by radio, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, today, I believe you're the Son of God. And I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. And make me new. Thank you, Jesus, that heaven is my home. And you're my Lord. Amen. And everyone look at me for a minute. All those of you listening out there. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, I want you to know something. Whether you realize it or not, there is power on the inside of you. Because all of a sudden your world has changed from the old world where it was all by your strength to now this new world where Jesus is there helping you through everything. I want you to understand something. You're an overcomer. You can conquer all things through Christ Jesus today. You can walk in victory. You can move out of hope into active faith. Amen? Look at the person beside you and say, Boy, I feel my faith stirred today. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, I'm going to pray a dismissal prayer over you. Our prayer team's up here. If you need prayer for anything, we're here to pray with you because I believe in a God of miracles. And I want to pray with you. I want to see God move in your life. But listen, when you go out there in that world tomorrow and you're going out there to your jobs, get your faith active. People come by and say they're worried about this or worried about that. Say, well, you know, you know Jesus. Be a witness for him. Be bold for him. And if it gets down to it, you say, listen, I don't know. But I know one thing. I was blind and now I see. I was lost and now I found. I don't know. I don't know all the answers. All I know is, boy, I was in a bad spot and I'm in a good spot now. Because nobody can argue with that. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, I just thank you for these people today. I just believe you, Lord God, as they've come in here today, that they're moving out of passive uh, passive hope and into active faith, Lord. I just declare today that as we go out in the world, that, Lord, we're going to touch lives. We're going to see people change. We're going to bless people. Lord, that we're going to be a church that's just full of faith, full of love. And, Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you for what you've done for us. So, Father, today, just bless everyone. Put your hand upon us, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hey, God bless you.